I thought that with the sham elections having just finished in Russia, now would be a super time to discuss the biggest existential threat that the world has ever faced, the end of democracy. First, I will readily admit that I am not a politician or someone who can claim to have studied its nuance in detail, what I am, is the average Joe, who sees the writing on the wall, I represent the truth from someone who is not part of the machine that controls us and I have a keen understanding of history which sadly always seems to repeat itself. So, here's how I see things. Some of the most toxic dictators the world has ever seen, started life, politically speaking, with the promise of something better. They gave hope to those that needed it, they stirred a sense of belonging in the disaffected and upset, for example Hitler didn't rise to power because post-World War I Germany was booming, no, it was in the toilet and desperately looking for a way out. Much in the same way a cult leader would accumulate their flock, using a natural charisma, they would go about creating a power imbalance between themselves and those who chose to listen. Undoubtedly narcissistic, the whole game of manipulation would be driven by a belief that they were somehow chosen to be in this place, in this time, at this moment to save them from a fear that they had a significant responsibility for creating. Whether as a member of a military coup or someone who perverted democracy, they have all achieved goals through the ultimate use of fear. Whether it be fear for the hated Jew or fear of the illegal immigrant or fear of becoming an internationally impotent country, it's always been fear that has driven these dictators to power. Hitler generated an irrational fear of the communists and his white flag operation to burn down the Reichstag and blame it on them and their impending uprising which promised wholesale death, destruction and general mayhem. This fear of the communists helped him effectively destroy the German democratic state and turn him into a full-blown dictator. A very real and current example of this fear and solution baiting, would be the issue of American immigration through the southern border. Donald Trump has made it the centerpiece of his re-election campaign. Him and his team have been playing up the fear to a level factor 10, describing it as an invasion, identifying any crimes committed by immigrants, calling them drug dealers, murderers, and thieves. Then of course promising the solution, mass deportation being just one touted idea. If he got to power, what would he choose to be his Reichstag moment? What white flag operation could he generate that could potentially give him sweeping powers to tip things over the edge? If he wins the election and gets the Senate, a scenario which is not outside the realm of possibility, what's to stop him? He has already indoctrinated his party and destroyed its inner checks and balances. He controls the House, and the Supreme Court is 6-3 to three in his favor. What's more his party has been systematically destroying democracy in stages, reducing voting rights, gerrymandering, removing those within their own party that favor the Constitution, in favor of those who only have loyalty to Trump. Besides that, he already sees himself as a strong man, favoring dictators all around the world, the idea of dictatorship is not something he hasn't considered favorably or even admitted to. What's more, he knows that his core followers completely support the idea of him being king and any internal opposition has fled the scene in blind panic. But it's the people's fear that is pushing him forward, that fear is palpable, stirred up by endless rhetoric, everyone is talking about it, if it's not the dangerous cabal of democratic pedos, it's the devilish workings of the shadow state, led by people like George Soros. There is a genuine belief that only Donald Trump can deliver them from all of it and so all it would take, is a moment, that he creates, to tip the greatest democracy in the world, on its head. What's more he has been single-handedly destroying the country's confidence in democracy and its value, by insisting without precedent or proof, that the 2020 election was rigged. Just that one lie regarding the election, has bought the method of governance that has formed a bedrock of American society to its knees, elections are no longer trusted, officials no longer believed. Then all of his legal issues have been declared which hunts instead of very real criminal and civil cases that need to be addressed, the result, the law is no longer sacred, the judges are deemed agents of the deep state, lawyers are now out for self-enrichment. Why has he done this, apart from deflecting from his own guilt? I believe so that when he ends democracy completely, most of the population won't even care or realize. Those that do, will deem it necessary to rid the world of corruption, a corruption that only he can identify or deal with. But it's the fear that he creates that will give him the White House. The people will line up to give it to him readily. 
citizens are already embracing the idea of a dictatorship. This fear starts to erode the method of governance and things move to what I call an illiberal democracy, not liberal but rather illiberal. This describes a governing system that hides its non-democratic practices behind formally democratic institutions and procedures. Writer Stephen Levitsky calls it competitive authoritarianism as he believes the use of the word democracy gives it a positive spin. The truth be told retaining democracy in the word allows us to remember how fragile that concept of governance really is and just how easy it is to twist democracy into something more malignant. Call it authoritarianism and you risk diluting the impact. One of the best users of this system to their own benefit is Vladimir Putin. His recent win at the polls was based on this pseudo-form of democracy. Elections were held, but his opponents were either dead or in jail. Marches were allowed if they were his supporters and new laws have been established to ensure continued success. A classic example relates to his war in Ukraine, largely hated by the Russian people, speaking out against it is considered illegal and he has used this to imprison opponents who understandably object to his actions in a sovereign neighbor's territory. There have been other red flags, like back in 2020 when he adjusted the country's constitution to exempt himself from presidential term limits, something that Donald Trump has joked about doing himself on more than one occasion. Even before that we had the invasion of Georgia and then the annexation of Crimea as he carved out additional Lebensraum for his Russian-speaking followers. These actions were not those of someone committed to democracy and the rule of law. But at the end of the day, it's Putin's curtailing of freedoms, surrounding himself by loyal friends, the establishment of a cult centered around him, the killing or imprisonment of opposition and of course the fear factor that has lifted him to the status of dictator and effectively ended any form of real democracy in the country. The recent attack on Crocus, post-election was in my opinion orchestrated by Russia to inflict mass casualties and to create the fear factor of an external enemy. It comes on the back of protests about Navalny, protests during the election and increased dissatisfaction for what was clearly a fraudulent vote. Putin needed something to get his people under control. Sacrificing a couple of hundred innocents wouldn't be a big deal for him, he has slaughtered hundreds of thousands in Ukraine already. He needed his 9-11 to take full control, to finally destroy any form of democracy left in the country and to establish himself as a de facto dictator. What's more, the intent of setting Ukraine up as the fall guy, tells me that we can expect a further ratcheting up of his efforts there. A switch to total war, more mobilizations, more hitting of civilian targets. He will do this because he has established the necessary fear factor to drive support at home and to hide internationally behind a flimsy screen of self-righteousness. What's more the facts regarding this attack points wholeheartedly to a Russian operation, the attackers were paid, they escaped, there was no immediate response and of course they were sent towards Ukraine. The intent to imply guilt upon Ukraine only serves to garner support for his fight, when, Ukraine has zero motivation to stage such an attack and for that matter, ISIS striking the West would have made more sense. Then there is Viktor Orban of Hungary, since his second stint as Prime Minister of Hungary began in 2010. He has chipped away at the country's democratic systems. Orban has imposed policies that are hostile to LGBTQ and immigrants. He has steadily increased his control of Hungary's public square by cracking down on the press, the academy, and the judiciary. When the 2022 election rolled up, he faced a massive coalition, yet he still managed to win by bending democracy to suit his narrative. He managed to win 54% of the vote but 83% of the districts, due to gerrymandering and other tweaks to Hungarian electoral rules. According to American journalist and author Andrew Morantz, Orban passed laws, amended the constitution and patiently debilitated, delegitimatized, hollowed out civic institutions such as courts, universities, and the apparatus necessary for free elections that are now controlled by Orban loyalists. Orban's opponent was given just five minutes on the national television to make his case to the voters. Private media outlets like the ATV and RTL, among others, offered playtime for opposition members. An example of the discreet, below-the-radar process of accumulating power by Orban and his party was the creation of a special police force that started as a small anti-terror unit. The unit grew and became more powerful bit by bit in disparate clauses buried in unrelated laws, 
effectively becoming Orban's secret police. But what really concerns is just how popular this type of a liberal government has become. It's fawned upon by so many as an example of how leaders should operate, its followers like the MAGA movement in America have embraced the strong-arm tactics of those foreign leaders, forsaking a dedication to democracy and their own leaders, who happen to come from a different party. But this type of behavior isn't new, there were many Western people who were pro-Hitler and who sought peace with Hitler at any cost. They were wrong, and yet history is repeating itself with people falling into the mistakes as those who have come before them. To MAGA, Putin isn't just innocent, he's admirable. Heroic, even, in some ways. He isn't defined as an authoritarian dictator at the helm of one of America's chief geopolitical rivals. No, he's defined as an anti-woke leader who defends Christian civilization by taking on the decadent West. With MAGA having spread throughout the Republican Party, any form of real objection to its spread and infatuation with Putin has been largely removed. More ominously, American democracy has always been about political parties pulling together to fight the common external threat. Now, the Republican Party has deemed Putin to be a way of ending their own internal political rivals. It's become a case of rather Putin than the Democratic Party, which means if they are happy to sell out their country to a foreign authoritarian regime, it's a matter of time before they give Donald the keys to the kingdom. Then consider how he has managed to seat his died-hard supporters within the established democratic framework, like Congressman Matt Gates, who is currently advancing a theory that the American Constitution's Second Amendment gives American citizens the right to overthrow their government despite the will of the majority. It's absurd yet remains a classic example of how tyranny starts to pervert the democratic framework to a point where it no longer has any power. This type of constitutional amendment would in fact make those who sought to overthrow the government on the 6th of January, victims, despite their actions being treasonous and undemocratic. What's more it opens the way, legally, for all those minorities unhappy with the government, to simply revolt, perhaps in support of Trump should he lose in November. A loss he would never accept and which would undoubtedly trigger more January 6th moments by the very same rabble he has so ably empowered. Worryingly, is that a large swath of America supports the concept of revolution, a total anathema before Trump came along. He has emboldened the rabble, especially those Looney Tune right-wingers who previously kept their actions hidden in the wilderness of the South, but now have found a home for themselves in the mainstream, where their conspiracy theories and right-wing ideals have given rise to dangerous talking points like QAnon etc. It's a highly concerning situation and an existential threat to not only American democracy but global democracy as well. At the end of the day, Putin and Orban have entered the American right-wing bubble, not because they are appreciated or necessarily believed, no, but rather as a way of preparing the route to America's own form of dictatorship and the start of an illiberal democracy. If America, the great bastion of democracy, loses itself, then the rest of the world will follow suit. It will be a matter of time before we are back in a state of active global war. The end of democracy will bring extreme nationalism and an end to globalism, as the world's leaders retreat behind their borders, so more vulnerable states will fall, either in terms of their own government changing its ideology to one more in line with their bigger neighbors, like the pro-Putin Robert Fico taking over Slovakia or simply be overwhelmed in armed conflict like Georgia and now Ukraine. That level of expansion will eventually lead to arrogant power, hungry personalities clashing and something far bigger or less controlled occurring. No matter what happens, we are seeing the final death struggles of democracy, its veracity and legality has long since been diminished and now the only question is, what comes next?